Welcome everyone to this Take 10 session on the epidemiology of psoriasis. I'm Jules van der Rijk and I work as a physician epidemiologist at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Here are my disclosures. Globally, it is estimated that around 60 million people suffer from psoriasis. And if you think of it, it is an immense number of people. For instance, this is virtually everyone in the UK having psoriasis or in the context of my small country, three and a half times the Netherlands suffering from this disease. In 2014, the WHO acknowledged psoriasis to be a serious non-communicable disease. And this report, which was published in 2016, helped to raise more awareness. And it was an important call to take psoriatic disease more seriously. It was also underscored that we lack data, as there are no data of 81% of countries in the world. And in turn, this report led to the establishment of the Global Psoriasis Atlas, which is a very large initiative to better understand the burden and the epidemiology of psoriasis, which has provided important new insights already, which I will tell you more about later. So far, the published prevalence numbers of psoriasis vary and prevalence percentages up to almost 12% were reported, uh, for instance, in Norway. And more recently, a systematic review was published, which included data of 168 studies. And for areas with no data, the prevalence was estimated with modeling techniques. The lowest estimates related to East Asia and the highest to Australasia. And the prevalence numbers of this review seem a bit lower than expected, uh, in my opinion, but I think it's important to note that the data of children are also included. A year later, a large study on adults in the US was published, showing a percentage of 3%. These data were self-reported by patients, and they were asked if they had been given a diagnosis of, of psoriasis by a physician. Uh, and the previous study was, uh, the data were all uh, physician reported. Besides the real variation that you can see in numbers, which I'll tell you more about later, there can be other reasons that lead to deviating prevalence numbers. For instance, in the review that I mentioned on the previous slide, outcomes were modeled also for regions with a low data coverage. And this leads uh, logically to more uncertainty in regions with less data available. And besides that, the difference in diagnostic methods might introduce bias. For instance, Physician reported data can lead to an underestimation as patients without access to healthcare are not cannot be present. And self-reported data of patients may lead to overestimation of numbers. And in addition, the quality of data can vary also, of course, which can impact the prevalence numbers. Variation in prevalence can also be real. First of all, I think it's important to verify whether you are looking to a point or cross-sectional prevalence or to the prevalence or risk to develop psoriasis during a period or even during a lifetime. And this context is very important as, as it can have a massive influence on the prevalence proportions. Also, the prevalence can differ depending on the characteristics of the population you're looking at. Age is very important in this, in this context. Because it's a chronic disease, the prevalence increases the higher the age of the population of interest. So the global prevalence for a pediatric population has been always below 1% in all studies. But the adult percentage differs from 1 to approximately 2.5 or 3% in point prevalence. And when looking at the incidence, these psoriasis can occur at any age but most people develop psoriasis between 15 to 35 years of age. And some studies have reported a second age peak around 50 to 60 years, but other studies could not confirm this finding. Sex is another important factor. Psoriasis is equally distributed between the sexes, though there are some other differences. On average, women develop psoriasis earlier, while men tend to develop more severe disease. And you see this back in cohorts with biologic users, where the proportion of men is often around 60%. And this prevalence shift is important knowledge, as the outcomes of biologics have also shown to be different between men and women, with shorter drug survival rates for women versus men, and more discontinuations in women due to side effects. 
So if you look at the global distribution, there are also remarkable differences. Originally, it was thought that there was a north-south gradient, so the prevalence seemed to be higher in the more northern countries. But this finding does not seem to hold in more recent studies, as is illustrated by this chart of the Global Psoriasis Atlas. And it seems the higher the income in an area, the higher the prevalence becomes. There are several possible explanations for a rise in psoriasis prevalence in higher income countries, including better access to healthcare and thereby less underdiagnosing, a better data infrastructure leading to more accurate numbers, and the increasing age in wealthier countries. The lifetime risk of developing psoriasis is logically higher when people reach a higher age. Differential genetic associations for specific populations have been discovered, but the data are very scarce. Environmental factors may also lead to a change in prevalence, and this may have a link with income as a Western diet and obesity rates increase in thriving countries, which may in turn, of course, will lead to a higher psoriasis risk. The presented psoriasis prevalence rates also vary among different ethnic groups. The recent study in the US that I referred to earlier showed that the highest prevalence was found in white individuals and the lowest in black individuals. And even after correction for confounders, the odds ratio of white versus non-white white individuals remained too. And I think that more research is needed to assess whether this is a true difference. Because in the sparse data from Africa, it's also shown that specifically people from West Africa have a lower risk for psoriasis than people from eastern parts of Africa. And as African Americans are often from West African ancestry, the lower prevalence in black individuals in the US which met, would match with insights from Africa. But on the other hand, other sh studies show that non-white individuals have less access to care, which could lead to underreporting of psoriasis risk in this group in the US. And also, it was shown that there is more diagnostic uncertainty regarding psoriasis diagnosis in black individuals. And this finding is also supported by the recent finding that people of color underwent more skin biopsies before the psoriasis diagnosis was made by a dermatologist. So in theory, there could be an underestimation of psoriasis risk in black individuals living in the US. In the last decade, a rise in the prevalence of psoriasis was observed. But interestingly, the incidence numbers do not seem to rise accordingly, except for two studies from the US. And in general, when the prevalence increases, but the incidence remains stable, this can possibly be explained by a rise in age alone. However, if both the prevalence and the incidence increases, like was shown in the two American studies, if environmental factors like lifestyle probably also play a role. So far, I showed you a lot of numbers. But epidemiological data are especially important to use in practice or to form new research IDs. As an example, I show you here a recent study from my colleagues from Internal Medicine, which has been published a few years ago in Nature Immunology. And as with psoriasis, non-communicable diseases in general seem to increase in urbanizing areas. And this now also seems to happen at quick speeds in Tanzania. What they found was that the immune phenotype shifted to a more pro-inflammatory one in those people that adopted an urban lifestyle with a Western diet. And they found that specifically food metabolites were associated with this change. And they are now investigating whether the traditional Tanzanian diet, which is mostly plant-based, is beneficial for inflammatory diseases. And although this study is not specifically on psoriasis, I see it as a great example what can follow from mere epidemiological numbers and shifts. I want to close this Take 10 session mentioning another source of epidemiological data that can give unique insights for practice. The National Psoriasis Foundation launched the Citizen Scientist Initiative, in which a very large patient panel provides data on their disease and experiences. For instance, they answered to the question what the most bothersome area was or when did they mostly suffer from itch at which time. So in my view, those insights are very unique and very handy for practice. So to conclude my session, I hope you all keep in mind that psoriasis is common, but that numbers are heavily dependent on many factors and circumstances that can be present. Epidemiological data can help you to form hypotheses, but we need more global data as many regions in the world still lack data coverage. And I hope you enjoyed this Take 10 session 
Thank you very much for your attention. And as we say in Dutch, bedankt.